or anything like that. It is instead going to be about the work and the ideas uh, of the man whose uh, uh, books uh, and thought we are discussing. We've got, as um, Hannah said, a really terrific panel, both here and virtually. Uh, and I'm, I don't mean they're almost a good panel, um, but electronically. Uh, let me introduce those people to you um, before doing a proper introduction to the star of the show. So first up on my left is the writer, lecturer and broadcaster who's best known for developing uh, Richard Dawkins' work on memes and more recently on what she calls teams, and she, that's T-E-M-E-S, uh, and she's going to be explaining some of that. Uh, author of The Meme Machine and her upcoming book on out-of-body experiences, a warm welcome for Susan Blackmore. Thank you. Uh, joining us live via the wonders of Google Hangout, uh, really a giant in the field of philosophy and uh, cognitive science, also author of Darwin's Dangerous Idea and Breaking the Spell, Religion as a Natural Phenomenon, in which he puts forward possible evolutionary explanations for religious belief. He's going to, and he's working currently on a book on memes from the United States, where he's a professor at Tufts University, Daniel Dennett. <laughs> on uh, my right here is one of Britain's most distinguished and prolific novelists and playwrights. He got over the fact that his career began at The Guardian and went on to much greater things, uh, writing the acclaimed novels Headlong and Spies, uh, as well as the uh, acclaimed farce Noises Off for the stage. Perhaps more relevantly for tonight's discussion, the author of Copenhagen, about the relationship between two giants of modern physics, Niels Bohr and Werner Heisenberg, uh, and has written and thought deeply about some of the subjects we're gonna be speaking about. Please, a warm welcome for Michael Frame. Again, from the United States, uh, via video technology, another uh, giant in the field of cognitive science uh, and a professor of psychology at Harvard University, one of those people who straddles, and this is going to be one of the things we talk about, uh, science and the humanities, uh, both language and the mind. His uh, hugely acclaimed books include The Language Instinct and How the Mind Works. Uh, from the United States, Steven Pinker. And completing our panel, uh, proper celebrity and star, the illusionist who has had a phenomenal uh, success on television and on stage, completed a recent tour, or is about to complete uh, a tour of a show which has been sold out everywhere, I know, because I couldn't get tickets for it, called Miracle. He's a master of the art of psychological manipulation. Uh, he has exposed people who profess powers that are somehow supernatural and in that connection took part in Richard Dawkins' Channel 4 TV program, The Enemies of Reason, uh, a warm welcome for Darren Brown. <laughs> but of course, the reason why all these great names in science, the arts, uh, and uh, our entertainment are all here is the man who's topping our bill tonight. Uh, as you heard from Hannah, author of The Selfish Gene, The God Delusion, Landmark Books, but also The Blind Watchmaker, Climbing Mount Improbable, person credited uh, with popularizing and explaining scientific concepts that would otherwise have been out of reach, regarded as one of the most influential thinkers, scientists, and intellectuals of our time, a warm welcome for Richard Dawkins. We're going to hear from all of them. Um, I've told our panelists that I want to avoid the temptation for this to turn into a kind of upmarket, this is your life. 
with, with me in the role of uh, Eamon Andrews. So uh, there's no red book, as you can see, uh, but nevertheless, I thought it would be good to just to get a sense of the impact Richard Dawkins has had on, on so many people. People might be surprised in the introduction to this new edition of the Selfish Gene to mark its 40th anniversary, you say you have some misgivings, not about the book, uh, but about the title. Uh, and it's one of those titles that has stayed in the mind of everyone. It's entered the language as a phrase, and yet you have some regrets about it. Tell us why you do, and what your per perhaps the alternative that you might have preferred instead. There are people who read books by title only and uh, see fit to criticize them on that basis. And I think The Selfish Gene has suffered a bit from that because p people have thought it was a book about selfishness. They have thought it was a statement that we, as a matter of fact, are selfish. They've even thought it was an advocacy of selfishness. Of course, it was none of those. Um, it was suggested to me by, uh, the, by a publisher, um, Tom Mashler, that I should have called it The Immortal Gene. The Im Im Immortal Gene is actually a, a, a major theme in the book. And he made the point that immortal is an upward, whereas selfish is a downward. And I think he's had a point. I, I'm not saying I regret the selfish gene, but if it had been called the immortal gene, it would have been treated in a different way. And somehow it's got a slightly more Carl Sagan-ish feel about it, uh, sort of the, a, a more poetic feel. To, to Do you think it would have done as well? You don't think no. it would? No, I think really provocative um, titles like that do well. I've, I've had this argument with Michael Rogers, the, the uh, publisher of the book, and he's adamant that The Selfish Gene was, was the, the right title. Yeah, yeah. I still suspect that The Immortal Gene might have been better, but I don't know. But it was certainly provocative. And you mentioned how people took it. And it's interesting, it came out in 1976, three years before uh, Margaret Thatcher came to power, and some people even thought it was somehow part of the spirit of that age about no such thing as society and selfishness. That was part of the misunderstanding that you felt in that period. Very much so, yes. I mean, I, I, I know who you're referring to, and I won't mention his name, but, but, but yes. <laughs> so, what now... He, what, what he said was, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that certain Oxford and Sussex dons are directly responsible for the election of Margaret Thatcher. But, <laughs> um, so for, for, for people who read the book a while ago or could benefit from a little refresher course, we turn to Sue Blackmore. What, can you just walk us through, because some of your work has picked up very much and built on the foundations of Richard Dawkins. Genes, memes, and I know you've added this new term, teams, we may even get to that, but just walk us through what, what, what these terms mean and, that, and how Richard changed our understanding of them, perhaps. Well, I'll go back to the selfish gene, because yeah. What was so powerful about that is what, what I took Richard to be trying to do, apart from explaining selfish genery, was to say that genes are not the only replicators. So he elucidated the idea of the information that's copied with variation and selection. Darwin's wonderful idea. You, all you need is three steps. Some kind of information, it's copied, it's not copied exactly the same, you get some variation, and then you select among the variants. If you grasp that, you can't really believe in God anymore, can you? Anyway, we get to that later. We're certainly going to get to that later, yeah. <laughs> but, but the point is, th at the end of the book, what Richard did was to say, well, I'm trying to explain it as, as universal Darwinism, this principle, you get those three things anywhere at all, and you will have this profusion of, of complexity of design coming out of, 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 of apparently simplicity. That applies to all of biology. But at the end, he tacked on this, this question, trying to make people understand it better. I hope I'm being fair to what you were trying to do. And said, are there any other replicators uh, on this planet Earth? And he said, yes, just look around, all around you. I mean, I can look at you lot. Look at your clothes, look at your hairstyles, look at the glasses you've got on, look at your shoes, look at the seats and the carpets. And all of these things, in these terms, are information competing to be copied. And he called that information... Well, he said, I hope my classicist friends will forgive me if I abbreviate my meme, which means uh, that which is copied, to meme, which sounds a bit like gene. And that was how the term meme was produced at the end of the book. Now, I didn't even really notice this when I read The Selfish Gene back in 1976 when I was a PhD student. It was years later, 20 years later, that I reread it and I realized the power of uh, universal Darwinism that we can look at the world in terms of replicators competing to, to, to uh, get copied. And in terms of us, the, the selfish gene is a brilliant title. It's like people hate it. Well, they hated the title of my book, The Meme Machine. 
And the Germans, even written the translation, refused to call it the mean machine because Germans don't like the idea that we're machines. Nobody likes the idea that we're machines, but you know, that's the idea that comes out of this. So we are the copying machinery that copies the memes. In principle, there's no reason why you shouldn't have further replicators pig piggybacking on top of that. So out of the gene machines, or the plants, animals, humans, come the mean machines, just humans are doing copying, imitation, and so on. And I'm playing with the idea that now we have produced uh, computers and um, that copy information with high fidelity, maybe there's a new replicator emerging. I've called it, I called it teams, and people spelt it wrong and thought it was football, so I've subsequently called it dreams. Choose which is better, it's a meme fight, one or the other will win. Yeah. But, but it's just taking universal Darwinism as what I think Richard intended. Look for replicators, see how they compete, and see how all this stuff appears because of that process of natural selection. And the process of replication that exists in the biological world, but also in the cultural world. Yeah, yeah, and, all and stuff. Let, Before we hear from the man himself, uh, let's bring in Daniel Dennett um, uh, on by video. And uh, D Professor Dennett, you have written about Dar Darwin's dangerous idea and also said that actually, uh, of all the human ideas, in a way, Darwin's is the very best uh, that any human being almost ever had. Can you just tell us more about that? Why this idea, partly e explained to the wider world through Richard Dawkins's book, but why this idea is so powerful? Sure, I think the, the key idea is that if you look around and think, what is there? There's meaning, there's poetry, there's art, there's, there's philosophy, there's culture, and then there's matter physics and chemistry and so forth. And how do we put those two worlds together? And until Darwin came along, people kept them really apart. The world of meaning, the world of the humanities was one thing, the world of the mind, and then there was the world of matter. And, and, and they, they didn't have any, uh, you couldn't get from one to the other. And then Darwin comes along with this master stroke this strange inversion of reasoning, where he says, no, in fact, minds and everything that we think of as mind-made can, can emerge from natural selection and create the whole world of, not just of life, but of human culture and art. Everything that exists in the human world ultimately are fruits on the tree of life. Uh, it's not just genes, as Sue says, there's also cultural replication, which is a very big part of it. Do, 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 let me just, that's something that just comes to my mind hearing, Daniel Dennett, to you, Richard Dawkins. The idea that this was this extraordinary idea, this one person, Darwin, a moment of inspiration or genius, you would think that this thing that is just about us, science or even do, you know, through Darwinian theory, we would have got there anyway. How come it takes one random individual, a moment of kind of almost, and I'm doing this deliberately to wind you up, <laughs> divine spark of genius, um, surely, uh, just through the sort of natural process, we'd have got there anyway. It baffles me why it took till the 19th century, uh, because I, I would have thought, I mean, I, I agree with Dan that it's, uh, the, it's the best idea anyone ever had in the sense that it's the most revolutionary. What it explains, divided by what you need to postulate in order to explain it, is, is, is huge. I mean, the, 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 the ratio is gigantic. And you think that Aristotle would have got it. You think that, that you know, Pythagoras would have got it, or Hume would have got it. Um, why did it wait for one, well, actually two, 19th century naturalists um, to get this st stunningly powerful, yet stunningly simple idea. Um, and I don't think that question has really been satisfactorily answered. It could be that the idea is so powerful that it seemed obvious to people that it couldn't have an answer, that, that the, the beauty, the elegance of a natural world couldn't possibly be explained in terms of simple mechanics. And therefore, it had to be done by a supernatural designer. And um, it required, therefore, an immensely bold stroke to, to depart from that and to say that there is a natural explanation. And Darwin and Wallace did it um, in the 19th century. Can I, can I, do you want to come in on this, Michael? Well, I was going to say, um, I think it could have been um, derived from reason alone. 
But yes. it wasn't, it was der derived from observation. Exactly. Um, and surely it was uh, derived at that point because uh, scientific observation, very precise, detailed scientific observation had become a discipline which had, which had developed and evolved to the point where you could notice very, very small differences between things. I think that's entirely right, and that's why it was Darwin and Wallace who, who got it. They were both expert, highly experienced field naturalists. Nevertheless, if you're looking for a, a great idea which could have been had in, from the depths of an armchair, yes. it is it, is it. I mean, anybody in an armchair could, could, have, could have thought of it. They didn't. It had to wait for field naturalists. Sue Blatton. We don't know that they didn't. I'm wondering how many great minds there were who sort of thought about it, but it's, it, could it be that people hate it so much? We've talked about how much they hate the phrase of selfish gene and mean machines and so on. It's taking humans down from their pedestal. We start, and we know this from uh, psychology, the developmental psychology of children, we kind of start as dualists. We start as designers. We are the powerful ones. We're in charge. We design stuff. To, f to make that flip, that Darwin made and that you then extended in the selfish gene um, is, is very hard and emotionally people don't want to do it. I'm not saying that Aristotle did think of it and did, didn't dare take it any further, but it's quite possible that it was that emotional antagonism that me meant it took so long. And after all, you, you wrongly said, you know, he suddenly had the idea. I mean, Darwin worked on that for 20 odd years before he actually dared come out with it because it's so offensive to people. Yeah, I mean, Stephen Pinker, if you're able to hear us, I'm interested where you stand on this. I mean, because people debate always the sort of great man theory of history, the mm. idea of if that one individual had not come along, would this big thing have happened, big historical events? Where in science do the sort of talent or genius of, in, of individuals, you know, present company included, but where, where, where does that fit in, in how we make these great leaps forward? And we've talked a bit about how it came to Darwin and others. Uh, it's, uh, I don't think it was so obvious that, uh, that it was inevitable or that someone would have come up with it, nor that we should be surprised that no one had uh, thought of it beforehand. Susan mentioned that there is something uh, in human intuition that works against understanding evolution, namely that when we see complexity, when we see design, we assume that there's a designer. And it's actually quite a, a conceptual leap to say that complexity comes from reproduction from replication. When I took high school biology, the reproductive system was just like, you know, the liver or the pancreas or, or uh, the, the muscles. It was just a system of the body. Darwin's idea was that if it weren't for reproduction, life wouldn't exist. I mean, there were ideas such as the spontaneous generation that mice could spontaneously generate from piles of straw. Uh, we now know, thanks to Darwin, that that just could not have happened even logically, because without reproduction, there could not be uh, adaptive complexity. It's not a, uh, to, to, to explain one set of phenomena, the astonishing richness of life, with another, the ability to replicate, is an enormous conceptual leap. It doesn't surprise me at all that it took thousands of years for someone to come up with it. But of course, because it is a, it, 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 we now know it's the correct idea, it isn't a coincidence that two people came up with it, nor that someone uh, would have come up with it eventually, but it does not occur naturally to us. Darren, you're, like me, you're not a scientist. We're the sort of lay people on this mm. panel a bit. Do, do, do the ideas in Richard Dawkins' work, even to the non-scientists, do they speak to you somehow? Yes, yes, of course. Um, and obviously, I was just thinking that the, the uh, Richard, I think, himself has said that the, the God idea is the opposite idea of, of evolution in that it, what it needs so much as an explanation is way out of proportion to what it actually explains. It does the very opposite of, of evolution. Um, so uh, Stevens just said that idea of people getting their head around that something so complicated could be explained by something so simple. I, I, given the sort of earlier culture and the life that people had, which was so theologically focused, that, that the idea of the very idea, that, that it's such a reversal of what was taken for granted that it is a, hu it's a huge conceptual leap for anybody to make, isn't it? It's it, it, it massive. And the, one of the things that I was talking about, how people seized on the idea and in some ways misunderstood it, and you might even think willfully did. One thing that happened, and maybe we'll bring in Stephen Pinker on this, is the idea that somehow, you know, the genes were destiny and this is what drew, decided people even individually. It was all encoded. That's been an area, a, a sort of misconception in, you know, popular thinking for decades. Do you, do you 
what role did your book play in either confounding that or actually, because of that potential to misunderstand, in people thinking, ah, so that person's like that because of their genes? Yes, insofar as it played a role, it was, it was massively misunderstood. I mean, um, the, the question of destiny is a deep philosophical question, which Dan Dennett's contributed a, a lot to. But it doesn't become a different problem if you suddenly bring genes in. Mm -hmm. So we can ignore the idea of genetic determinism. Could I add one more thing to the mystery of why it took, took so long? Um, Ernst Meyer, the great centenarian um, founding father of modern um, e evolutionary genetics, um, suggested that it was because of platonic um, essentialism. Um, if, you, if, you, if you're a geometer like, like Plato, then, then you see a triangle um, as a, or, or, some, or a sphere as an ideal form. And he regarded real triangles and real spheres as kind of imperfect approximations to this ideal. Meyer's theory is that people were used to that idea applied to living things. So you had an ideal rabbit, an ideal rhinoceros, and real rabbits and real rhinoceroses were approximations yeah. to this ideal form. And if you, think of, if you think of rabbits and rhinoceroses and kangaroos as having ideal forms, you're automatically resistant to the idea that they could change into something else. So that's Meyer's explanation for why it took so long. The, so there was actually a barrier in the way we the saw The dead the hand of Plato, yes. <laughs> so we can always blame Plato for everything. The, um, we, can I just add, add on, on Plato in, in that case? Um, wonderful story. There, there was an ancient history don in, in, in New College. Who, who's, you mean he was a very old don? No, or he, he was a no, don he, in he, ancient he, history? He, he did end up rather old. But, <laughs> but, but, um, and his life's work, this is an exaggeration, was to decide whether Plato or St. Paul was the greatest shit of all time. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've elegantly taken us to our, uh, I, to our next subject, really, which is about religion. Um, uh, I should mention that we are going to, I'm deliberately going to leave a lot of time for your own questions to this panel, in particular, I'm sure, for Richard Dawkins. So I'm going to just push on uh, and get onto this uh, you know, other huge area which, in which you've written so prominently, uh, and it is the book, which is also 10 years old this year, The God Delusion. Um, Let's just speak, why don't you kick us off, Darren, Darren about this. The, the, how important, uh, you know, Richard Dawkins, he was hailed as one of sort of a group of so-called new atheists. Uh, and in your own uh, work, in this tour that you're doing now, you describe it as secular faith healing, or that's part of it. Why don't you tell us what that, is, what that idea is about and what sort of debt it owes to what Richard Dawkins and, and others have been writing in this area? Yes, well I, I grew up a, a, a Christian and went to various quite happy clappy churches as well as quite quiet Anglican ones and uh, sort of grew out of it because I didn't really have a Christian uh, family or friends particularly. Um, so I'd sort of drifted out of it at university after having become a hypnotist and a magician and things that sort of made me think more skeptically. Uh, it was only reading The God Delusion that kind of, I think as for a lot of people, finally gave it a sort of a language and... Uh, in the way that you tend to find things inspiring that articulate something you already kind of feel but haven't really found the language for. Um, so now, uh, how many years on? 20, 15 years on? Like, no, 10, 15 years on? Since Ten then, since reading it, pardon? 10. 10. 10, goodness, yeah. I, um, yeah, I'm doing a secular faith healing show at the moment, which I'm touring with. And it's, uh, it's, there was definitely a guilty moment, I think, a couple of years after I come out of a belief when somebody actually said, oh, well, do you believe in God then? And I sort of said, no. And it was the first time I'd actually said that. I had a little, little burst of uh, guilty adrenaline. And that was it. It just disappeared. That was gone. Um, yes. But, uh, but yes, it's, I'm, I'm now in this inter interesting situation where I'm um, taking an audience largely like you. I mean, certainly not an evangelical audience, probably the very polar opposite of an, e uh, of an evangelical audience and doing faith healing on them every night, <laughs> um, healing them. Uh, and I've got them, you know, falling over in the aisles and all the rest of it, and something I thought would never, would never happen. It's been a very interesting project. I thought I'd start off uh, understanding the, the, the mechanics of how it would work and how I could sort of get it to work with a, with a secular and very skeptical audience. I thought I'd maybe achieve a bit of sort of pain relief and that you create enough adrenaline and people will not feel pain. I didn't expect to get quite the extent of uh, response that it's, that it's had, so it's been a very And it's part of your thing. purpose in doing it to expose as fake somehow yeah. healing that is in the name of faith. You're showing it, it doesn't... Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the part of the problem with any sort of debunking is that you're, 
yes, you're sort I'm of just saying, um, you know, normally just no, this thing isn't, this isn't true, and you're sort of trying to supply facts to the contrary, or to the contrary of the demonstrations that you're trying to discredit, um, which isn't really a very interesting or entertaining message compared to what the the charlatans themselves are doing, which which is much more sort of engaging. So what I've always tried to do is replicate. Um, oh, so you didn't want the religious devil to have all the good tunes, mm. as it were. Oh, absolutely, yeah. But if you just stand there and explain how a psychic works, for example, and somebody will listen to that probably and go, okay, well that's how psychic. But it's but not how the psychic does it that I saw because she made me feel this, so therefore it must be something else. Sorry. And what happens apart from them falling down in the aisles? I mean, what do you have? Oh well, they they pro properly healed. Maybe get, not get up out of their wheelchairs and <laughs> Maybe dance. not for very long, but they are, I mean, I've, I've had, there's a small percentage of people, I mean, I don't know what the percentage is, but I'm guessing a very small percentage of people that do say, just so you know, it's three months later and the arthritis is still gone. Um, I'd imagine 99% of people, it's an entirely temporary thing that happens. And I'm very open about this. I mean, it is done in a, I, I play the role of the faith healer, but I absolutely bookend it with, um, uh, you know, very open about what's, what's going on. Um, but Your yeah, point I've is... So your, point, your point, I suppose, is to show that so-called real faith healers are actually what well, fakes, and that there's nothing religious about it. Yeah, or certainly, I mean, the most I can show, of course, is that here is something that can be perfectly well reproduced. Mm. It doesn't, therefore, logically extend to, therefore, all of that must be fake, but certainly what I find myself doing is taking the bits that can be reproduced and going, well, look, this can certainly be done without recourse to a, uh, an extraordinary explanation. So, so Daniel Dennett, um, the, you, you, at the same time as Richard wrote The God Delusion of Wallace, at the same time, you brought out a book, Breaking the Spell. There was uh, Christopher Hitchens, Against God, Sam Harris, uh, in the same territory, and you were branded as the new atheists. What was new about what all of you were doing? I think the only thing that was new was that we were just being open and candid about it. Mm. But unlike most atheists, of our generation, we simply announced, well, of course we're atheists. And, but we also added to that uh, why we were atheists and why we thought it was important for the world to reflect on the fact that probably a great many of the people they uh, listened to and respected and admired or were just friends with, were, who in fact didn't believe in God. And the very idea of coming out as an atheist, uh, has, I think, traveled very well, and the numbers reflect, at least in the United States, uh, uh, the number of people who now say candidly that they don't believe in God, that they have no religion, is, uh, has been going up very fast in the 10 years since we wrote our book. So, do you, and it was more of a taboo, particularly in the United States, to admit you had no faith before the books that all of you wrote, do you think? I don't think it was quite a taboo, but I think it was considered, oh, sort of nobody's business, and uh, most atheists don't want to impose themselves, uh, and I think that's right, on the rest of the world. Uh, but the political situation 10 years ago uh, was fairly dire, and a number of us, Richard, I remember talking with Richard about it, decided that well, we had to do something. We couldn't just be genteel academic atheists anymore. And uh, we did our different things, and I'm very glad we did. Hearing you say the political situation was dire 10 years ago, <laughs> you want to try how it is now. But, the, um, but let's, not, let's not wander onto that. I must restrain myself. Um, Michael, you've got a sort of dissenting position a bit on the on the new atheism and the, and the Dawkins position, the Dennett position, but why don't you explain? I'd, I'd like to interject, interject a slight note of dissent. Um, I don't think anyone here is going to dissent on evolution, and I don't think anyone is going to dissent um, in uh, the admiration we all have for Richard Dawkins and, and what he's done. Um, if you'd asked me when I was younger if I was an atheist or not, I should have certainly agreed that I was. In fact, when I went into the army to do my national service, um, you had to have your religion written down in your pay book. And I insisted against a great deal of opposition that they wrote down atheist in mine. This was almost impossible. It was not thought to be an option that you could write down. In fact, it was so impossible that the, the clerk who wrote it down didn't know how to spell it. He spelled it 
uh, ACIS. <laughs> so I spent the next two years uh, described as ACIS, which sounded as if I was even ACIA than the, <laughs> the other ACIAs. And in fact, when, uh, uh, I, when I came out from having the, the pay book written, um, an officer came out and uh, said, step forward the atheist, and I stepped forward, and he walked slowly around me, looking at me from head to toe, and said, I've never seen one before. Oh. <laughs> well, since then, I've slightly changed my position. Um, I've got slightly more radical. I wouldn't now describe myself as an atheist, because I think that is allowing oneself to be defined by uh, people with religious belief, mm. and I don't like that. Why uh, do I not have to call myself an A Cinderellaist or an A Father Christmasist? Um, because, surely, uh, nobody thinks, no adult thinks that Cinderella or Father Christmas is real. They don't think statements about Cinderella and Father Christmas are factual statements. Um, if you say, um, I'm an atheist, it seems to me to suggest that statements about God are offered as factual statements. Um, whereas I think they're usually not. Uh, are they offered as fictitious statements? Not as consciously fictitious statements, no. But I think people can be within a story, just as they can be in, within the story of Cinderella or whatever, and you can accept what's going on within the story. And I think religious uh, people do. So um, I would um, suggest, well, I find it difficult to believe, is that anyone believes. Um, and I suspect that when people who say they believe, say they do, they're using belief in a rather different sense uh, from the way it's, if, that we all use it in everyday life. In everyday life, it suggests openness to correction. If you believe something, as opposed to knowing it, it means uh, uh, you think it's a bit uncertain, or you might change your opinion if uh, evidence changes. What religious people mean is absolutely the contrary. They mean they will not change their minds, whatever comes up. Present any evidence you like, and their belief is uh, stronger than that. Does it mean, therefore, they're not actually making really an intellectual statement about themselves? They're no. saying something more about their identity and who they are and what tribe they belong to? I think, this, I think, uh, so I think there are complicated reasons why uh, people uh, say they believe, why they, they classify themselves as, as religious. Uh, and I think one of the reasons is they want to enter into this great uh, fabric of story which has been built up uh, over the centuries and there's many very beautiful aspects of I it. Mean, many, many painters and, uh, and composers yes. have built the, the fabric. So, so, Richard, what do you think about that? The idea that, that in a way you were hitting the wrong target because what the people who you were calling or branding as believers weren't really believers in the, in the normal sort of in way we use that word, and rather they, they were making a statement about their, their relationship to history and ancestors I think and many of story them were, and all yes. of that. I think, I think many of them were, um, and I think that the, the people that I was aiming the book at were those who, in a vague sort of way, thought they were believing in the, in the sense that Michael isn't talking about. I think, I think there are a lot of people who, who, who hadn't thought about it very much but who felt, oh, well, looking, look, look around you, it's obvious it has to be made by something. Now, that is a scientific statement. It's, it's an erroneous scientific statement, but it, but it is a scientific statement. And it was that erroneous scientific statement that I wanted to dispel. There are other reasons that people have for being religious, for saying they're religious. There are political reasons. It, it, it remains true that not a single member of the 535 members of the United States Congress uh, are, are openly non-believers. They all purport to be religious believers, which they cannot possibly be. What about um, if, it's a, if it's emotional for people? It's a source of consolation. Some people attack yep. you saying, you know, you're trying to take away something yep. that consoles me. What, you know, and there are yes. other bigger threats in the world. Why didn't you go out attack them rather than attacking this? Yes, I mean, I, I care passionately about what's factually true. And um, if something is consoling but false. I, I love, there, there was a, a remark, I probably misquote from Steve Pinker, he'll correct me. He said something like, if you're being chased by a tiger, you may console yourself with the belief that it's a rabbit. But as a matter of fact, <laughs> it is a tiger. <laughs> well, well, I think... Uh, uh, go on, uh, and then uh, I'll bring in Stephen Pinker. Uh, go on, uh, Michael. The, the old dictum about there are no atheists in foxholes seems to be perfectly reasonable. If you're a foxhole and you're just about to get your head shot off, 
Um, any comfort you can find in believing or saying anything seems to be perfectly reasonable. Try me. It won't, it <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I will try me. I, but I find this very frustrating in the, the arguments I have with people. Because, like Richard, I will always go for the truth, however uncomfortable it is. If I think the evidence is good enough, then that really matters. And I take a kind of joy in, in almost the uncomfortableness of some of these ideas. That is so pleasurable to see how you have to twist things around and, oh, it becomes clear. But I'm often talking to people who don't take that view. Evidence is not so important to them. How it makes them feel, whether it helps them in their social relationships and so on, is more important. And I just find that very difficult to cope with. I don't know what to do about it, because then I feel I'm being cruel and horrible by saying, well, you ought to care more about the truth. <laughs> but, I mean, I suppose the question is harm. What harm does it do if the people in Darren Brown's audience or the people who go to church come away with some kind of good feeling? What's lots the of harm. harm. That's a really good question. I think lots of harm, and many people disagree with me. I think Rich would probably agree. Because if you give... I mean, I've done lots of work on the paranormal and so on. What harm if people believe they've got a guardian angel or they've got telepathy? Right. It leads them into a, an anti-scientific way of thinking into uh, rejecting scientists as horrible, you know, reductionist, materialist, horrible, unfriendly, nasty people who believe all that stuff. And they shut themselves in a kind of bubble of it's all lovely and we know the truth about the astral planes or whatever it is. So I think it does matter. Steve, um, we'll come yeah. to you, but Stephen Pinky, because you're there. Uh, well, what about the um, uh, comfort argument and the, you know, you've... Um, so, or rather, hang on, here's a better place to take this. What about for the, the case of scientists who nevertheless have faith? Yeah. I mean, what do we, how do we explain that, given what Sue Blackmore just said about the apparent contradiction? Well, psychology tells us that a lot of um, belief formation uh, is not guided by argument and evidence, but it is a way of expressing solidarity with a, a group that you uh, want to identify with. Uh, and so, uh, in fact, a lot of people's um, belief in evolution or opposition to evolution has nothing to do with how biologically informed they are. In fact, tests of scientific literacy show there isn't much difference between creationists and believers in evolution. Just that you know that there are some people, there's a tribe that you want to believe, that you want to belong to, they believe in evolution, so I believe in evolution, or vice versa. I actually think that the, the reason that, that uh, it, it is, has been so uncomfortable for people to say that they're atheists, uh, and, and I share the feeling that, that, that Darren had the first time that I had to was directly asked, do you believe in God? About 25 years ago, I don't remember ever believing in God, but no one had ever asked me. And I do remember the blood coming to my face when I said, no, it felt like confessing to a murder. And I also share Michael's uh, discomfort with the term atheist, because it is uh, a term of, of negation. But really, the, uh, the, the reason that it has such a negative connotation is people identify it with being an amoralist, someone who believes that there is no source of morality, that we can just be uh, selfish uh, psychopaths. And uh, humanist, for me, is a more appealing word because it doesn't uh, define your belief by what you reject, but rather uh, identifies the basis for a, a sounder morality, namely the flourishing of human beings, life and health and knowledge and beauty and, and friendship and, and love. Uh, and it's I think the, the uh, important task for uh, getting people not to find a source of their morality in religion, such as finding a savior or obeying religious laws or bringing, making religious laws the law of the land, is to be clear that there actually is a sound basis for, for morality, that you don't need to get it from religion, which I think is what most people think, which is why they reject the term atheist, but rather if you are believe that, uh, that life is better than death and, and uh, health is better than sickness and knowledge is better than ignorance, yes. you have that basis for morality. So to Richard, when you come across a fellow scientist who is also a religious believer, is it your understanding that they don't really mean it, that they're not real believers, they are instead on the lines that Stephen was saying they might want to uh, adhere to a tribe, they might find mm -hmm. that, it's the, that it's the only way to be somehow moral, they're not genuinely a believer in the supernatural and in the... A, a tiny minority of them are genuine believers, but a, a, a huge number of them are loyal to the tribe, to quote Martin Rees, the recent president of the Royal Society, um, who goes to church, as he says, out of loyalty to the tribe. Um, and do you, obje do, you, do you object to that? Do you think, or can you be comfortable with that? Can you live with him doing oh, that? Oh, I mean, uh, I, I said, when I was subordinate of New College, I said grace at, at, din at dinner 
rather agreeing with Freddie Eyre, the great philosopher, who said, I will not utter falsehoods, but I have no objection to uttering meaningless statements. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, and I mean, I, I, um, I value the, the sort of tribal aspects. I had an Anglican upbringing, and I, I, I like Vickers. I mean, you know, they're always terribly nice people. And people like hymns and all of that kind of thing. Hymns. But what talking yes. of Vickers... There was a little sing-song of hymns in the green room beforehand, I should reveal, but don't worry, mm -hmm. Richard Dawkins wasn't involved. Um, talking of yes. Vickers, what about Dan Dennett's discovery about how many Vickers actually are not believers? Well, and then what the trouble they get yeah. into than being trapped in the... Daniel Dennett, if you can do a minute on that, because there's, I do need to move things on, but this is, I know, an area of your own work. This is you know, men and women of the cloth who are themselves non-believers. Just tell us about that. Yes, um, Linda Lascola and I decided to see if we could find them, and we did by the dozens. And Linda interviewed them and brought out a book. Uh, the, the two of us wrote a book called Caught in the Pulpit, because these people are trapped. They're trapped in lives of deceit and, uh, and uh, misery. They're very lonely people. And uh, now a play is being written from the transcripts. The remarkable document, these people who are devoting their life to a church. They're baptizing and, and marrying and all the rest, and they don't believe a word of it, and it really bothers them. I'm happy to say that Richard's foundation was uh, instrumental in funding this research. So your, your work goes into there. Listen, before we leave religion, I have to put this to you because it, co it comes up a lot, particularly on social media. This is the idea that you're not just against religion in general, but you appear to have a specific problem with Islam. And, and, and I want you to you know, have a chance to talk about that. There was, there was a, the particular tweet, it was in 2013, when you tweeted, haven't read Quran, so couldn't quote chapter and verse like I can for the Bible. That's your Anglican upbringing in. But I often say, Islam, greatest force for evil today. And there are a whole lot more in that vein. Is, you, is it your contention that all religions are equally bad, or is there something particularly problematic about Islam? And if it is, uh, you know, how do you defend yourself from the charge that you somehow are anti-Muslim? I am anti-beheading, whipping, lashing, <laughs> flogging, clitoridectomy. I'm against all those sorts of things, regardless of which religion they come from. If it, if it can be shown that one religion practices those things, of throwing homosexuals off high buildings, etc., um, treating women like not just second-class citizens, but fifth-class citizens. Um, if there is a religion that does that, then I'm against it. But what about yeah, people yeah. who would say some Muslims might be doing those things? <laughs> Everyone would agree on those awful things. People would say two things, wouldn't they? They'd say, first of all, you know, have a look at the Christian Middle Ages. All kinds of awful things were done in the name of Christianity. And they would also say, now, okay, some Muslims are doing those things. It doesn't mean that's true of all Muslims or all Islam. Obviously, it doesn't mean it's true of all Muslims, and I've said that over and over and over but again. But you said Islam is the greatest force for evil today, not, yeah, not the Muslims. Not the people. Not the people, yeah. not, 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 not Muslims, but Islam has the capacity to, to do evil because a sufficiently large minority of members of that, of that faith perpetrate these awful things. Christianity did the same thing several hundred years ago, but it isn't several hundred years ago, it's now. Richard says he hasn't read the Quran. I had d done the very boring thing of reading the whole book. It's very repetitive and it's very horrible and it's full of all these punishments and what hap should happen to people who don't believe. In but, but the Old Testament or the New Testament would have its fair old share. Oh, it would of that have too. its fair share. It would have its fair share. Yes. But one of the great things in the selfish gene is that Richard, in a couple of pages about memes, showed the basic tricks that religion, that the monotheistic religions play. If you believe this, you are a good person, reference um, Pinker and so on. If you believe this, you are a good person you will, and you will get a heaven. And if you don't believe this, you are a bad person and you will go to hell. That's simple logic and it runs through the whole of, of, of those religions. But it's particularly obvious again and again, page after page in the Quran, what must be done to the unbeliever, the apostate and so on. And it's the same in the, in the Bible as well. But the point about that is that not so many people follow the Bible literally anymore. So um, the, the, the Bible has potential to be. I mean, if everybody believed the Bible, the world would be in a most appalling place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. You, it also, since it's uh, not rational, it offers the most amazing 
possibilities for sectarianism, because if there's no evidence that <coughs> yes, the one particular version of religious belief is better than another one, um, it's fertile ground for um, absolutely arbitrary differences springing up, as they do in Islam, as they do in, uh, in Christianity, um, which leads believers to persecute, not non-believers, but their fellow believers. And, I suppose, and we'll, we'll get into this more in questions. I suppose the thing turns on whether you, know, you would have been as vocal against Christianity in the me medieval period as you are against Islam now. Yeah. I suppose if you're, if, you know, uh, that's where people worry that you have singled out Islam particularly, but you've answered that point about what's going on right now. Before we open up, I just want to ask, uh, just to hear a, a couple of you on this question of the relationship between science, very broadly defined, and these other questions. Uh, uh, and in a way, we've got into one of them. But I just thought we'd start with you on this, Michael, because um, you know it was always said, C.P. Snow famously said it, that we had these two cultures, science on the one hand, arts on the other. And there are you, somebody who is you know, in the arts, a journalist, and then a playwright, and a novelist, but nevertheless taking on some of these scientific questions, uh, and then almost you know, in the rev reverse direction, somebody like Richard, who, you know, scientist who then weighs in on these other questions. Uh, is that gap that C.P. Snow identified, is it coming closer, or is it still there, and there just are a few people, and we've got several of them with us tonight, who are straddling that divide, but mainly the divide is still there. Well, the shaming thing is that those of us who are on the, uh, what might be described as the art side of the divide, um, have no ability at understanding science. A lot of us are extremely interested in it and passionate to know about it. Um, but there are difficulties. As Richard Feynman said that uh, trying to explain physics to someone who doesn't have mathematics is like trying to explain music to the tone deaf. And by God, he tried, he tried, he tried, he tried to explain physics to the tone deaf. Uh, and the shameful thing is that on the other side of the divide, on the science side, there are a lot of scientists, uh, a lot perhaps, there are a number of scientists, um, outstandingly Richard Dawkins, who are brilliant writers, who are not able to describe in words that even I can understand um, what science is about. Um, so there is this uh, appalling discrepancy, and I wish I could uh, put it right for myself, but I can't. Can I just interject yes. an, an anecdote? That, um, uh, when Copenhagen was shown in the Oxford Playhouse, um, Michael repaired to an upper room above the play Playhouse where there was assembled the cream of Oxford physicists, many fellows of the Royal Society, Nobel Prize winners, and firing questions at Michael about his play Copenhagen, uh, grilling him really. And he came through it absolutely marvelously and showed every indication of understanding the deep questions of physics. I, I think this is testimony to the kindness and politeness of scientists. <laughs> <laughs> so how, how, on that, just how were you, because it's for most people, that's a kind of nightmare they have every now and again, is being standing in front of such a room. How were you able, if you hadn't studied physics, to master it to the extent that you could survive a kind by, of group viva like that? By reading the works of scientists and science writers, a, a, a very important um, aspect of the whole thing is, is journalists and other writers who can actually understand science and, and make it uh, comprehensible by reading those books that are accessible. It, and even those, I find extremely hard work. Well, well, I've always wondered, Sue, Black, Sue Blackmore, whether scientists, who, sorry, writers who manage to explain science to the non-scientist end up being reviled by their fellow scientists and regarded as not real scientists. Uh, as if the real scientist is in, in, uh, unintelligible to everyone else. And if you're writing it accessibly and clearly like Richard, well, then you must be a popularizer I rather think, than a real scholar. I think that used to happen. I, I, I don't really know because I'm somewhere kind of in the... I'm not, you know, I'm not a science journalist or something like that. I'm, I'm a scientist by training. I just happen to have had a weird career going, you know, not serious, sensible job after job kind of thing. So I, 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 can't, I can't really speak from personal experience. I certainly haven't felt that sort of reviling. But one thing I want to say to you two that, or, you know, I think you're putting yourselves down in a way because, yeah, I'm a scientist, but look what's happened to science. I mean, we're no longer 300 years ago when it was possible for somebody to read everything and understand all the science there was. I mean, 
even in neuroscience, which I would say is now the closest to my interest, and I read a lot of neuroscience, some of it is completely beyond me. And the complexities of the uh, mathematical analysis of fMRI scans, for example, I just like, look, I just have to let <laughs> believe that they know what they're doing, which is dodgy because they may not. And we, all the conclusions I'm drawing about near outer body experiences and how they're generated in the temporobrietal junction and stuff, I have to take an awful lot on trust. And that's just in my own area. Not the rest. So you're only this, you know, we're, we're equals here. When you say you take it on trust, another word for trust is faith. <laughs> <laughs> and it's I a wonder, temporary faith but I wonder, the evidence. No, but I wonder, Richard, if in a way we have replaced the old priesthood with a new priesthood who use this language that we find marvellous and moving, but we don't fully understand it. Uh, and we defer to you, and we hope you know what you're doing. I mean, there is a bit of a religious type no, relationship, no, isn't there? No, no. And you're a high no. priest. No. no. Those of us, you're those the of us, you know, Sue, Sue is right that, that m many scientists, most scientists, don't understand other science. I mean, most biologists don't understand physics. Indeed, I think most physicists don't understand what <laughs> um, But this matter of is it, is it faith, it is a kind of faith. But it is faith that's not based upon just nothing. It's a faith that's based upon knowledge that the scientific procedure involves replication, involves um, peer review, involves repetition of experiments when they're at all, at all doubtful. I, I don't understand physics, but I do know that if a physics paper is written which claims, for example, that neutrinos travel faster than light, somebody is going to repeat that experiment. I know that the paper has been refereed by experts in, in the field, I know that, that science is an extremely disciplined subject, dis set of subjects, in which we bend over backwards to disprove mm. what, is, uh, what is being alleged. Um, so that s the procedures of science are set in place in order mm. to avoid self-deception, in order to avoid believing things that have, have no evidence. So even if you don't understand yes a particular subject, you do understand the procedures that have verified that, that, um, uh, the, f the, f the, the finding that you, 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 you don't understand. You it try is to radically the different. Faith. It's totally different from, from, from faith, which, do, which is just, I believe it because I believe it because I believe it, or I believe it because my grandfather believed it and has yes. passed it on to me. We're going to go to questions. Darren, you just want to come in with one quick one. Y yeah, I was just thinking, the... Um, Going back to what Richard said earlier on about caring passionately about uh, what's true, um, which I'm sure we all do, and probably you more than any of us, uh, but th there is, there's the other thing that we care a lot about also, which is meaning, which is where I think the, 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 the softer side of the divide, story and art, comes, in, comes into play. Um, the, I, I remember I was uh, giving a mediumship demonstration once on stage and being very open about that it wasn't real. And afterwards, a, a girl at stage door said to me, oh, could you put me in touch with my grandmother? And I said, well, you, you understand that I can't, that what I'm doing is fake. And she said, oh, yeah, no, no I know it's fake, but can you still put well. me in touch with my grandmother? <laughs> yeah. And what, what, what's interesting to me about that, and it goes back also to this question about people taking comfort from it and whether that's, whether that's okay, um, is... Uh, is this idea of, of meaning. One of the things that we've obviously gained over the last couple of hundred years is uh, we've sort of um, uh, moved away from a lot of superstition, particularly around death, particularly sort of morbid superstition. But I think you could say, that if it, in, and as part of being grown up and mature, is to be able to tolerate ambiguity, that one uh, flip side of that is that we have lost a lot of uh, connection with um, story and meaning and narratives around things, for example, like death. I think death's a very good example of it. So now what we have is largely, I think, the experience of, of, of death and dying for people is a very lonely and scary thing because there is no meaning attached to it sort of anymore. So the, what tends to happen is the meaning, the, 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 the central characters that provide meaning become the medical profession, um, which is maybe fair to say is largely more concerned with extending life than quality of life. Those are two very different things. And for the person who's actually dying, they're certainly not the author of this story that is probably the one point in your life when you come to close, you know, if a, a novel finishes, the last chapter makes sense of everything that comes before. It doesn't happen in life, it's just sort of curtailed. So more than any other time, here is a situation where taking ownership mm -hmm. of the story and feeling like author of your story and bringing it to a close 
is most important and probably you feel like a sort of a bit part, like a cameo part, and the main parts are being played by the, um, mm. the doctors and, and your loved ones and so on. And that, that the only narrative really we do have nowadays is that of a brave battle, which is entirely to serve the other people, make other people feel better yes. for yourself. It's, you know, so I, I think that that's, it's about meaning, isn't it? That's the, the other thing we care about, because if you don't have meaning, that's when people throw themselves off bridges. The thing about meaninglessness and some people wondering if a kind of, and I know you don't like the word deterministic, but whether a very Darwinian approach to these things somehow robs life of meaning. I know it's a book, in a question you address, you say the opposite. Maybe we'll come back to that. But listen, let's see if we can get pre pre bring in people here. Um, ge there's a gentleman there. We'll get a microphone to you. Uh, and uh, let's see the person over there. If you can, number three, if you can take it to this lady here. Because I'm, I'm always keen, people know me from doing these events, we always do our best to get a gender balance. We like Theresa May's cabinet in here. <laughs> We're going to make it 50 50. Let's see if there's anyone with a hand up here. See if you can find a woman question, we're all going to go to you next. Yes, number one. <clears throat> uh, good evening. So um, I'm, I'm definitely a humanist, a non believer atheist. But where I wobble is sometimes the need to believe in signs or having significance in signs. Sometimes we call about it serendipity. So my question is, does, is there a place in this ecosystem, in this, the way we believe, um, for serendipity? Is it, is it a question of energy? Is it a question of statistic or probability? Or is it just voodooism? Anybody would like to take that one? I was thinking of you, Darren, but anybody would like to take that? That's uh, good. Then no, we'll, we'll take a set of questions. Um, that's why I always like to say, yeah, number, f have we got somebody at number four? Yeah. And, yeah, and then we're going to go to number three, yeah. Sorry okay. that I'm doing this, I can't see, yeah. Um, my name's John Neal. If um, nobody in the world believed in God, would it be a better place? <laughs> Thank you. Over here. Uh, yeah, I would like to ask, uh, I feel that it's very difficult to take faith out of people, as if you can consider it as a set of beliefs. The question is, maybe there's a third way, is in a sense, people could believe, but it would be a personal matter. And maybe what we have to try to focus is to stop the replicator of the, that leads to organized religion. That actually it's responsible for a lot of bad things in life, in this world. So probably, we should probably face the situation that faith is, should be always a personal matter. Thank you. Good. And then here. Thank you. Um, given the um, incredible weight of evidence against it, why does religion endure? Why does it carry on? Okay, let's go with those. We'll have time for another round. You wanted to go first on this point about the humanist who admitted very honestly that he occasionally has a wobble and looks for signs yeah, and don't, serendipity. Don't wobble. Just, you've got the answers in there yourself. Uh, statistics, probability, I've done a lot of work on this. There's some simple sums that, given how many people live in England, how many die, you know, the most classic thing is to dream of someone who dies. And if you do the calculations uh, of someone dying within 12 hours of your dream, it's going to happen to 76 people in Britain every year. Now, you know, those people are going to go, wow, that's so incredible. I had that dream and that person died. But it is stats. My response <laughs> to people who have these, my response to people who have the, the, these kind of wobbles and they write to me and I, you know, I say, enjoy the serendipity. I mean, just have that openness to um, amazing coincidences happen. Go, oh, isn't it fun, this world in which these things happen? Enjoy it. Don't think there's some, you know, um, uh, Carl Jung's A causal principle or, or God or anything else. Just enjoy it. We are, one of the interesting things, if, if something has a, like winning a lottery, it has a one in 14 million chance of happening, it will happen one in 14 million times. That's the very nature of something that has a one in 14 million chance of happening. Uh, but we're so terrible at sort of holding those ideas of kind of big numbers in our heads that, that we go, well, you couldn't possibly explain that through coincidence. It's a one in 14 million chance. <laughs> With a lottery, we know that happened. I remember a story of a guy that was, um, uh, and again, like Sue's saying, it's a great story, and it's, it, that's really all it is. But he, um, uh, was, he was worked with the AA or the RAC, and he was fixing a car in the middle of nowhere and was walking back to his truck, and a phone rang, a phone box rang, and he's in the middle of nowhere, so he goes in and picks up the phone, and, and it's the secretary of his office who's calling him about a question. So he answers the question and then says, how on earth did you know to call this number? How did you know I was walking past this phone box? And she said, what are you talking about? I just rang your mobile. He said, no, 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 you haven't. And so she, she's got his mobile written down, but above it, 
She's got his tax number written down. She's called the wrong number, and the tax number ah, happens to be the number wonderful. of the phone box that is walking past. Great. Now, the interesting thing about that example, I think, is that there's no, we can't attribute any kind of theory of mind or any kind of motive to that. There's no story other than that is clearly just a remarkable coincidence. Whereas, if you took probably less likely the odds of actually winning the lottery, the moment you've had a dream or you've played some numbers that have come to you from somewhere else beforehand, we, we want to make a story out of that because of meaning. We want to give that meaning, which the AA the phone box thing doesn't give us, but we can, you know, you, we can see when we look back at it, of course these things have to happen and actually it's, it's kind of straightforward. The Nobody meaning ever says, work. I had a dream about somebody I hadn't thought about for 35 years and then I discovered when I woke up, he hadn't died. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Da Daniel, Dennis, if you're there, I'm interested to, for your answer to the question about why does it endure? And I said when I introduced you that you've written about possible evolutionary explana uh, explanations for the persistence of religious belief. So what, in answer to the lady's question about why it endures, what possible evolutionary function might religious belief serve? I think that's the wrong way to think about evolution here. What evolutionary function does the common cold serve? Every society that's ever been looked at has the common cold. Why does it survive? Because it's very well designed to survive. It's a very fit uh, parasite. And I think religious means are similarly very fit. They've been yeah. designed by cultural evolution to thrive on the human psyche. They have been very well adapted to exploit our weaknesses and comfort us when we need comforting, and as a result, uh, it thrives, and it doesn't have to be good for anything. Except that you're except saying... Don't thrive it. Mm. It, except that you're saying, in, in, in the course of saying they're not good for anything, you just said, why well, they are good for something, because they provide comfort which persists. That is a small benefit, perhaps, but that's not why it survives. The main point is they're good for the virus. They're good they're for themselves. Good for the virus. Yeah. Oh, I see. Sorry, Mike. One of the selective pressures which uh, tends to uh, favour the survival of religion is the likelihood in some societies of getting your head chopped off if you <laughs> don't believe it. <laughs> but although it's in, for in, the, in, in the Western Europe, Western world, it's persisted for centuries without that threat. Surely, on the, on the logic you just said, it would have died out with the Middle Ages. Well, it persisted for a long time with that threat, and that threat uh, then modified to social exclusion, various forms of social exclusion, which, which is also a very, uh, uh, a very strong um, motive for believing. But surely I the logic of all you scientists is we wouldn't carry on believing it unless it was, had some sort of value. You're, you're well, suggesting no, here no, no, that no, it's persisted. No, no. It's persisted even though it's I'll, bad I'll, for us. I'll you take, take, take it. You take this one, Richard. Go on. Hold my coat. I'll deal with this. <laughs> Go on. Value means value to the replicator. It does not mean value to humans. In Dan Dennett's e e example, the value is to the virus. And then in his, what he went on to, the value in the case of religion, it's to the religion itself. It's not to, to humans. Can Can I just add yeah, I want to bring in Stephen, but go on, so yeah. Just remember how the religions evolved. It's not the same thing we're talking about for 2,000 years. Loads and loads of, look at the, there's a, people have drawn the, the evolutionary tree of religions. So they're trying out, the religions are trying out all these different possibilities. The ones that suit the human frailties are, are the ones that keep going. Stephen Pinker, what, what, the, one of our questioners asked, would the world be better if there was no belief? Uh, unfair of me to throw that one at you, but what do you think? <laughs> well, <coughs> depends on what, uh, what else people would believe, because as Michael Crane uh, pointed out, uh, atheism is just the negation of one belief. It uh, depends completely on what the person's other beliefs are. So if we believe in uh, that human flourishing is a good thing, that we ought to be hungry and, uh, and feel sick and enhance knowledge and believe in, uh, the religious beliefs that those replace uh, will be missed and the world undoubtedly will be a better place if religion is replaced by uh, some equally uh, toxic belief system like, uh, like fascism or communism, then the world could be a worse place and we know that the world was a worse place when those alternative belief systems were the, the substitute for, for religious belief. What we need is a, a vigorous 
uh, humanism, a vigorous commitment to human flourishing. Uh, and I think we're seeing that. It isn't typically mean humanism because it has a bit of a nerdy connotation. But if you look at the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, if you look at the Millennium Development Goals, if you look at what universities and hospitals and democracies actually do stand for, then uh, th those are belief systems that are not religious, but are very much worth defending. And if those took the place of religious beliefs, we'd, we'd be uh, much better off. Thank you. The last one for you of that, of that round, and it's interesting, all the questions have been in this area of religion, but um, what about the lady who said, you know, a third way is if it's purely a private matter. So it doesn't lead to people chopping people's heads off. It doesn't lead necessarily to the, yeah, the invidious outcomes you were describing of discrimination. It's just a personal matter inside someone's head. What problem would you have with then, Richard? I'm rather fond of the, of the saying which says everyone is entitled to their own beliefs. They're not entitled to their own facts. So if the belief is about a factual matter, <coughs> which I regard religious beliefs as about a fact, factual matter, then it may not do any harm, but it's not true. And I care about what's true. If you don't care about what's true, that's fine. You can just say, well, it's fun to believe so and so, and I, I, I believe it because it feels good but, or something like that. But do you like read that. novels, Richard? Yes, of course I do. And you like them even though they're not true? That's exactly the point. I li I, I'm, I'm capable of distinguishing what's not true from what, from what is true and of, of enjoying enjoying fiction because... But that's in a way what the lady was implying, I think. She was saying it's your own personal thing, you're not, you know, you're not making big universal truth, external truth claims for it. It's just for you. Michael. Yeah, um, the difficulty is to keep the private and the public apart. The best yeah. defense of religious belief I've ever heard came from my then 11-year-old granddaughter. When her mother said, do you believe in God? She said, do you mean, uh, can you praise God? Can you talk to God? Of course you can. Um, she said, it's just like having an imaginary friend. But the problem starts when the imaginary friend suggests you go out and uh, kill somebody next door. And uh, imaginary friends sometimes do. <laughs> do you want to add to that? No, no that's, that's, that's tot totally right, and of course, that, that's the main, the main reason for, for what worrying about it. I just, I just add my scientist reason, which is that, it, that, that the truth is beautiful, the truth is elegant, the truth is, is lovely, and to tell children these ridiculous false beliefs about imaginary friends when they could be believing in the glory that is the real world, that is shaming and, mm. and is, is not doing justice to our children. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> mm -hmm. You even, I think, once called it a form of child abuse to raise a child with religious beliefs. No, I, I, what I called child abuse was two things, was specifically teaching children about hell, which I think is a form of child abuse, if they really believe it. And unfortunately, the evidence is that many people do believe it. And that is, that is a, a abusive. The other thing that I thought was child abuse was labeling children with the religion of their parents when yes. they're too young to know and, and to call a tiny baby, a Catholic baby, or a Muslim baby, seems to me to be abusive. Let's take more questions. Um, we've got number, there we are, over microphone number four. We've got somebody already lined up. Yeah. Uh, this is a question about religion, and it's for Richard. Um, I, I was born a Catholic, and um, I'm not sure what I am now. I don't think I'm a Catholic anymore. I hope you have a good memory, Richard. This goes back some time. Some time ago, you were involved in a question and answer session with Cardinal George Pell, I think it was, in Sydney. And during that session, he indicated that Adam and Eve uh, may have been a religious story uh, told for religious purposes and were not real individuals. At that point during the discussion, you asked him, uh, where did that put the doctrine of original sin? Now, uh, what I saw on YouTube, there was no reply to that. It was glossed over. And I'm just wondering if after off screen, whether you asked him privately, where did that put original sin? Or have you put that question to any other Catholic? How original sin can exist if there were no original parents? Well, uh, original Let, let's um, take a few more. We'll, sorry, we'll, we'll, sorry. We'll the let's hear from this question over here. Yeah. Hello, I have two young children. I'd like to ask Richard, do you think it's okay that they believe in Father Christmas? <laughs> Thank you. I know you have a daughter yourself, and I would like to know whether you encourage that in your household. Oh, okay, so whether we have Father Christmas in the Dawkins household, we're about to find out. That's good, I want to know that one. Um, now, remember my point about Theresa May's cabinet? I'm seeing a lot of male hands here. We've um, got over number three. I'm hoping you have a few. No, it's a male question. 
Let the record show that I did my bit. Here we go, yeah. How, how can we know that the scientific method and belief in it is not just another parasitical meme, but one which happens to appeal to the frailties of uh, more intellectual minds? Very nice. I'll have a go at that one. You're not going to applaud that, surely. <laughs> yes. It's not all going on. Now, do we have a woman over here? Who does? Uh, okay, wherever you are, because I can't see, but go right ahead. Stand up. Um, I wanted to go back to Darren Brown's Thank point you. about meaning, which I think is really important. And I wondered if Richard Dawkins would share any personal reflections about his search for meaning in a world free of religion, and anyone else on the panel. Lovely. Thank you. Well, there are may, a lot of these are directed at you. Um, why don't we, first of all, I'm, I'm going to have to ask you about Father Christmas, whether you have Father Christmas in the Dawkins household, and if so, how you explain it. Uh, yes, um, we did. Um, the thing about Father Christmas is that when children uh, finally realize there is no Father Christmas, they're quite happy about it. And the, the odd thing is that they don't do the same thing with God. Mm. And that's, that's mm. the, really, the, the really weird uh, thing. I, I remember what, 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 sorry, what don't they do with it? You're happily give it up. They, they give up Father Christmas, but they persist with God. You Why do you think that is? I'm baffled by it. <laughs> That's interesting. That's interesting. Okay, well, I'm, no, I mean, I'm not that baffled, but I... I liked you being baffled. <laughs> I like bringing out your baffled side. That was interesting. Um, what, what about the, um, your, the... It's related, the idea of your search for meaning. How you find meaning in a world where you obviously can't fall back on those religious stories, you don't believe in them, but what, what, how do you get meaning? I think you perhaps related to it when you said the glory of the real world. But exactly, I mean, that, that, well, if, I, if, if, if I had to get meaning from the impoverished worldview which is religious, I would be very, very sad about it. Um, look at the universe, look at the world, look at, look at life, look at yeah. geological time. These are beautiful, elegant things which, are, which have poetic meaning and to, to substitute for that the idea of, of a sort of father figure in the sky, an imaginary friend, as Michael said, that's just so diminishing, so, pov so poverty-stricken. But you would include art and music, perhaps, in, in the glory of the world? Of course I would, yes, yeah. very much so, yes. Well, what, you wanted to pick up the question about... Yeah, yeah um, why did the, people clap? ...the scientific meme being yet another parasitic... I, uh, yeah, Richard didn't want people to clap, but I suppose I don't mind people clapping because it's a good question. Because once you understand the concept of a meme, you understand that scientific theories are memes and the scientific method is a, is a memeplex and so on and so on. So what's the difference? Hugest difference you can have. In religions, the whole process that's in the structure of the religion is keep believing this, keep believing this. It's trapping you in and don't escape. It's the exact opposite in science. Oh, you think that's the right theory? Well, I've got a better idea, and you're wrong about that. Let's go and test it. Let's argue about it. It's constantly questioning everything, and that's part of its structure. It's open, ever-changing, ever-evolving, and that's, that's my answer. Good. Thank you. Dan <coughs> I'm going to ask, put this to, to Daniel Dennett there, this question about meaning, because the question you did ask for other voices from the panel. You, Either the clergy that you've spoken to who then eventually sort of come out as non-believers, or even in your own life, once people have either given up a belief they did have or a belief they never had, do they, is it your experience they do find meaning elsewhere, and perhaps in your own case, where and how you found it? Yes, I think there's uh, no mystery, no mystery about this at all. Um, if you want to find meaning, find something more important than yourself and devote your life to it. And there are many choices. You can devote your life to music or uh, uh, justice or peace or democracy or uh, philosophy. And there's all the meaning you could ever want. Uh, and in personal relationships, uh, the idea that we depend for meaning on an imaginary uh, being is, on the face of it, absurd. Uh, that's not the kind of meaning that uh, survives scrutiny at all. Let's, the last one, it was just the question who heard you with um, Bishop Pell and want to know about original sin, you, you know, you, whether you'd ever got a good answer to that question about how original sin squares with the fact that there aren't any original parents. Jesus is supposed to have died to atone for 
original sin. Uh, and the, um, of course, that's an embarrassment to Catholics, but now they know that Adam and Eve never existed, so there was no original sin. Um, and so it's, it's the, other, the other kind of original sin they're supposed to be atoning for is the sins of all of us, including those people yet unborn. Um, it seems to me to be an as astonishing, actually rather obscene idea mm. that God, who is supposed to be all wise, the all wise creator, the genius of mathematics and physics, who invented quantum mechanics, who invented relativity, <laughs> that this prodigious genius wasn't able to think of a better way of forgiving the sins of humanity than to have himself tortured and executed in atonement. <laughs> what a disgusting idea. I, I knew you'd get a round of applause. Thank you. Um, there's a lady there who's very patient, so after we've heard this question, we'll go up a few rows. Yes, keep your hand up so we can see you, but we'll take the first question. Yeah, microphone number three, here we go. Yeah. Um, you were talking about how different religions have sort of managed to stick into society really well, and I wondered if you thought that there was one factor or many factors that have enabled the current world religions to build their way into society so well, whereas if someone came up to me and said, I believe in trolls, you'd think, well, that's really strange. Whereas if someone said, I believe in God, it's sort of, well, that's accepted in society, that's your own view. Okay. Um, if you can get the microphone several rows behind, and meanwhile, we'll hear from number four. Um, John Polkinghorne talks about the God of the gaps argument, but shoots it down by saying that science has gone too far and we can actually explain things. Do you, my question is, do you think that science will ever go so far as to be able to completely disprove God? Thank you. By God of the gaps, you mean the idea that God explains the things we can't explain other ways. Yes. Um, are we there now with number three? Yes. And then we'll come to number two. Hi, my name is Christina. Um, I couldn't help but realise that the religion seems to be the best example of marketing gone well <laughs> in the entire world. So, for example, um, I think Richard Dawkins said that maybe it's good for you, maybe it's not, but it carries on living. That's the same for smoking. Maybe that's the same for using the iPhone. I'm part of the tribe that use the iPhone. Why? Because I believe in it. Mm. Discuss. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think we can probably take two more. Number one there. Uh, yeah. The panel briefly discussed Islam earlier on, and I'm interested in whether they have an answer as to why the Middle East hasn't had the same new atheist revolution that we seem to have had uh, in the West. Thank you. And then, I think this is going to be the last one of this batch, and it may end up being the last one for the evening. Yes, here we go. Um, yeah, I was wondering will. whether uh, the panel believes in free will, <laughs> and if you don't, what your opinions on determinism are. Thanks. A nice short question for the very end. <laughs> Thank you for that. Well, wh why don't we um, go around? I'm going to, because this is going to be our last round, I'm going to make sure you get the last word, Richard, for the evening. So um, why don't we see who else would pick up one of these? Um, what about this thing of whether science will ever just so thoroughly win this argument it will disprove God altogether? I was, going to, I was looking at you, Sue, but Darren might want to weigh in on this. Can you imagine oh. a complete knockout victory where the religion sort of pack up, go home and go, OK, you've got me, you've won. Can that yeah. ever happen? Well, the, I, I, I think the problem there is you're trying to prove a negative, and it's not your job to do that. It's not a scientist's job yeah. to do that. Um, if somebody says, if somebody makes an extraordinary claim, and we all know this, Hume said extraordinary claims demand extraordinary evidence. So if somebody, if somebody says, uh, if a magician says that I can, uh, I'm, I'm really sawing this woman in half. I'm really doing it, it's a real woman and a real saw, and I'm sawing her in half, and she really is in two pieces, then I really put her back together again, and he expects you to take that seriously. Um, it's not enough for him just to say, well, you can't prove I'm not doing it. You'd say, well, you've got to come up with some real evidence. Now, if he then says, well, if you want evidence, come see my show, I do it every night, that doesn't count. The demonstration of the thing isn't evidence, that's the very thing you're, you know, you're questioning. So you would say, well, come and do it under some sort of controlled conditions. We can all agree to it. If you say any woman, we'll provide a woman. If you say any saw, we'll provide the saw and so on. So we'll, we'll all you know, discuss what those terms are. And, and then, if you can do it then, of course, then of course, of course, fair enough. Your show doesn't count. Come and do it under controlled conditions. Um, and that's sort of the job of science with these things, isn't it? You can't prove a negative any more than you can prove that there isn't 
you know, if I said I've got a green mouse in my house, you'd have to, how would you ever prove I hadn't? You, you could never consistently look at every area of the house at every single part at the same time to, you know, eventually prove there's no green mouse. I'd have to come up with a green mouse because it's my job to do that. So with these sorts of claims that largely fit into the kind of extraordinary sort of world, luckily it's not up to the rest of us to prove that they're not true. Okay, I'm going to go to Stephen Pinker. Um, just the, the, the free will determinism question is a huge and an enduring topic, but I just wonder if you can just give us something on it, particularly because of your book, Blank Slate, and the extent to which we shape ourselves. I'm slightly adapting the question, um, and whether or not we, you know, we, we are masters over ourselves and our own fate, or to what extent it's already determined, whether genetically or some other way. So I'm just giving you a little tweak on the question to see what you think. Yes, we're certainly not determined in the mathematician sense of our behavior being predictable with uh, probability equals 1.0. There is a lot of uh, randomness, whether it comes from randomness in development, randomness in the uh, handful of genes that we uh, in inherit from our parents, um, the complexities of a brain with uh, 10 trillion synapses. I think free will exists only in the sense that there is a difference between uh, the neurological process that determines what I'm saying right now and what happens when the doctor hits my knee with a hammer. Uh, namely, one of them, uh, there's a very short causal chain uh, that, that is completely predictable. The other one uh, involves such uh, staggering complexity that we can't in uh, practice uh, predict it. It doesn't mean that a miracle takes place every time that I make a decision, but it does mean that the uh, process is uh, so staggeringly complex as to be un unpredictable and therefore not to be deterministic in the sense of uh, being perfectly predictable. Thank you. Um, I've got this, I'm trying to make sure all of you have a last say, but who wants to have a go at why the big faiths have persisted, whereas, you know, Cinderella stories haven't? And I'm going to look at you, Michael, because you mentioned the difference. We don't say we're an a cinderella -ist, but Theos <laughs> persists. Islam, Judaism, Christianity, they've lasted. What is it about those memes, or if you like, that, has, that have held us while the others haven't. It has to be said the Cinderella story has persisted for a very long time. Yes. So it's the Father yeah. Christmas story. Uh, not for the entire population. People tend to, to give it up. Um, but the big religions are highly organized. and They have a lot of um, uh, pressures they can bring to bear on uh, people who, who don't accept them. Do, do you want to have a... I want to say something about free will, if I may. Please do. Yeah. What interests me about free will, having stopped believing in it, or trained myself to stop believing in it a long, long time ago, um, is, is how you live without believing in it. I interviewed a lot of uh, scientists, neuroscientists, philosophers, and so on, um, about this question. And so many of them said, well, of course, there isn't, isn't really free will uh, in the sense most people believe, but you have to act as if there is. I say you don't. I say actually I think life can be uh, much better and easier if you systematically give up belief in free will. We have willpower. Some people yeah, are stronger than others. Difficult. We have freedom, you know, we're in prison or not. But the will is not free. What we do is caused by a million other things. And I think living with that a kind of acceptance that our lives unfold in this unpredictable way. and instead of fighting against it. I, I think it's a, it, that's a really important question. I'm not really saying I've got an answer. I just try to live my life that way, and I like to encourage people to stop arguing about determinism and, and just go for it. I think I'm going to, because we're so short on time, and I want to get in Daniel Dennett, who's written m extensively on free will, uh, and uh, you should, you, and disagrees with Sue. So perhaps tell us why you disagree with Sue and how we should live <laughs> with this question. Um, with what she said today, I don't really disagree. I just would add a, a one amendment to it. Um, the reason people worry about free will is often because they're adopting a Cartesian view of their own mind, mm. and they're thinking of themselves as an immaterial ego or self that is uh, outside the world of physics and outside the world of, of causality. And uh, uh, this comes out very nicely. Uh, somebody recently wrote a book called my brain made me do it. To which my response is, well, what would you want to make you do it? Of course, if your brain makes you do it, that's the best. As long as you've got a good brain. That's, that's the ideal of free will. Uh, uh, if your brain is in good working order and it makes you do what you do, then, you're in, then, then that's what you want to be. 
and, uh, and if you think free will is something above that, and many people do, then you're just wrong. It isn't <laughs> Thank you. Um, because I want to make sure Richard gets our closing moments and we've okay, only got well, I, really quick. Uh, if the suggestion is we don't make real choices, I think that's a ridiculous suggestion. And the, the uh, rejecting that because you believe uh, things must be determinist is a metaphysical belief because plainly there are many, many, many situations, not just in relation to human affairs, but in relation to the external world, for instance, in, in uh, quantum mechanics, where predictions cannot be made. Uh, determinism fails. Um, and to, to insist there must be some explanation is absolutely, precisely metaphysical. It's preferring the, the principle to the evidence. Fantastic. Richard Dawkins, we're all here to discuss and think about your work, and we've done that tonight. You've heard those range of questions about free will, the persistence of the big faiths, why the Middle East has not had the kind of new atheist revolution that you've uh, been so much a part of here and elsewhere. You can pick any or all of them or just some closing thoughts on all the different topics tonight, but I want you to have the last word. Well, on free will, I always dread the free will question. It always comes up. And I can, especially in the presence of Dan Dennett, who would, who would dare to answer it, um, I can never do better than to quote Christopher Hitchens. Do I believe in free will? I have no choice. <laughs> you do, you do, you do! <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, it, do, doing a, a summing up is difficult. I mean, I'm obviously uh, deeply grateful to everybody who's turned up for this, for this and, um, and for giving us such, such fascinating answers. Um, it's the, this, this year happens to be not just the 40th anniversary of the selfish gene, but the uh, 30th anniversary of the blind watchmaker and the 20th anniversary of climbing Mount Improbable and the 10th of the, of the God delusion. Um, of course, if you write enough books, they, you're bound to hit some. some <laughs> um, um, and, and so, I mean, insofar as I have a sort of theme that runs through all of them, um, I suppose it is uh, partly the rational um, view of life that, that um, everything ought to be explicable, we ought to be striving to, to explain. And, and anybody who actively fights against the urge to explain is pernicious. And, and is an is an enemy, I, th I, re I think. Um, the specific point about um, my my view of, of Darwinism centres, as Sue has said, on replicators. It's all about the survival of potentially immortal code mm. and bodies. Everything we see around us, the big things, the trees, the animals, the the, the, the lions, the flowers, and things. The question that you ask about them is what is that animal doing that's good for its genes? Why is it doing it? And the answer is because it is descended from a long line of ancestors, all of whom succeeded in becoming ancestors. It's an obvious point, but a lot mm. follows from it, but not a single one of your ancestors died young. Many others did die young. Not a single one of your ancestors failed to achieve at least one heterosexual copulation. There may be some IVF babies here, in which case, I, that, that's a spe special case. Um, uh -huh. But um, the reason why all us animals are so good at doing what we do, whether it's flying or swimming or jumping or running or hunting or thinking, the reason why we're so good at it is that the genes of, that made our ancestors good at doing it have come down to us. And so we are machines for propagating the the, ve the very coded information that made our ancestors survive in whatever way they did survive, which is, of course, different for different, different species. I think it's only after an, an evening of extraordinarily enlightening and stimulating conversation, it only falls uh, to all of us to thank this extraordinary panel, Michael Frame, Sue Blackmore, Darren Brown, and online Daniel Dennett, Stephen Pinker, and, of course, top of the bill, Richard Dawkins. Thank you.